Good, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the New York University School of Law. Uh, I know many of you, but not all. I am David Rosenblum. I am the director of the International Tax Program. And this is our, I'm happy to say, this is the 20th year of the International Tax Program. We're very happy, uh, very fortunate this year for our Tillinghast lecture to have uh, Pascal Saint-Amand as our, as our lecturer. Uh, as you uh, doubtless know, many of you know, the, uh, Pascal has uh, a accomplished what is pretty close to a miracle by steering the uh, BEPS project, uh, the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project of the OECD, through a, uh, a three-year process to, to completion recently and approval uh, by the G20 in Lima just last week where uh, I understand that 14 finance ministers showed up to bless this project, which is, I think, really quite astonishing. Um, and I can say from personal experience, speaking on this subject literally throughout the world, that uh, whatever else can be said about or should be said about or will be said about BEPS, it has captured the attention of millions and millions of people and, in my view, is the most significant development in international taxation in, in many decades. So we, all, we owe a great uh, uh, debt of thanks to Pascal, uh, who has already been with our students at lunch today. I can tell you his presentation is going to be fascinating. Pascal comes, uh, is, of course, French. He came from the uh, uh, École Nationale d'Administration in Paris and was a, a member of the French Tax Administration for many years before joining the OECD. Uh, he was appointed, I think it was three years ago, he got involved in, with, the, um, with the BEPS project and he has been single-handedly the person behind it uh, from its inception. So without any further words of introduction, I am going to turn the microphone over to Pascal. And like all of you, I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged and, and happy uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, as a Frenchman, very impressive to be here at New York University. I'm not even graduated in law, so I mean, addressing you is quite a challenge and, and quite exciting. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, as, as you've said, it, it, it could sound like this uh, conference, uh, this lecture is, is timely, because we, we just delivered the BEPS package uh, last week. It was on Thursday, we had a dinner uh, with the G20 finance ministers and on the menu they had BEPS. <laughs> and they seemed pretty happy. Uh, the Turks were sorry because the catering company was unable to deliver food, but we delivered BEPS and, and, and they were very happy. So happy that the day after, on Friday morning, uh, we, we planned a press conference with the G20 presidency, the Turks, the Secretary General of the OECD, the incoming presidency, which are the Chinese, and, and then we received emails of a night. Uh, well, my minister will come, and then Jack Lu, well, I'll be coming, and then some others. So I spent the night looking after the Peruvian, changing the stage and making sure there would be a ramp for Mr. Schäuble with his wheelchair coming up to the chair. And we had, we had 14 ministers. Uh, present at the press conference to say how happy they were with this work. So that, 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 was, that was quite nice. But is it timely to talk about that now? I, I wonder, actually. I wonder because we know what we've delivered, but, but we don't know yet about the impact. We don't know yet about the implementation. We don't know yet whether in five years' time people will look at it with, with a, a smile of Denon to say, well, that, that was a nice try but didn't change anything, or well, they did awful thing and the world has collapsed. Some think so, I don't, but, but maybe. Or, I mean, that was just a nice step forward, but, but now we've completely changed with unit taxation, which has been agreed by two, 200 countries. Unlikely, but who knows? So, it's timely to talk about this, but, but also not, not that timely, not to mention the fact that it deprives you of, of the debate, the real debate in Las Vegas tonight, but, but you can record it. and. Watch it later, I suppose. Uh, so, as, as we are 
too much, I mean, talk too close to the event. Uh, what, what I would like to do today, and that's why I asked to add uh, to the title the reference to exchange of information, not to lecture you about FATCA, Manal did it brilliantly last year, uh, nor, nor to, to talk about two, two broad things, but uh, just to try to have an overview of what has happened over the past five, six years in the international tax environment, which I think will translate in a real change of environment, something like a new architecture. Whatever we think of BEPS, whatever we think of, of exchange of information, there will be some major architectural changes. And, and that's what I would like to, to discuss with you tonight. I mean, Ita Greenberg, who's here, uh, mentioned that uh, in an article, the new international tax diplomacies, or maybe I'm the new international tax diplomat. Uh, but, but for sure, um, there is something new that we collectively need to understand to see what, I mean, what's, what are the best things we can draw uh, out of that. And, and to start with, I, I, I would like to, to raise a paradox. Um, I will quote a French philosopher, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, and I will do it in French. Uh, Je préfère être un homme à paradoxe qu'un homme à préjugé. I, I, I'd rather like uh, paradoxes rather than prejudices, and, and that's so true. So one of the paradoxes is how come in a world where you have increasing tensions, I mean, look at the geopolitical situation, it, it doesn't look good, I mean, it's pre pretty gloomy. At that time, you've never had such a degree of cooperation, of goodwill, of states, of countries which are so different on a topic which is at the core of sovereignty. And I think that's a big question. I'm, I'm not sure I have the right answer to that. But for sure, it's striking that we've been able, for the past 10 years, to put an end to bank secrecy, to organize massive tax cooperation across countries, that we now are able to come up with a plan, and again, whether we like it or not, we do have a plan, we do have a package of agreed measures by all the G20 countries, all the OECD countries, that's 90% of the world economy, and I should say, a number of developing countries. And, and I hear some critics saying, well, developing countries have not been involved, they, they, they have not had their say in this process. I can tell you that in practice, they have been queuing to join, and they are queuing to join this process. They want to be involved. They want to have their say, but they have had their say. We had more than 18 developing countries, or non-OECD, non-G20 countries involved in that process. 62 countries have agreed the BEPS package, and many more are supporting it. So how come in, in this increasing tense world have we been able to, to achieve these? That's what I, I would like uh, to uh, drive you through. And the, the first act of, of this play, I mean, it's a three-act play, so the first one is about uh, the shift from the G7 slash OECD world to the G20 OECD plus world, and that was about exchange of information. International tax has for a long time been in the hands of techies, I mean, you tax lawyers, we tax administrators from different governments, and we were happy to meet in Paris from time to time at the Committee on Fiscal Affairs or at some BIAC meetings, and nobody understood what was being negotiated. And in different treasuries, I mean, the, 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 the people in charge of real stuff, the domestic stuff, were looking with some envy uh, and jealousy, the people going to Paris to go shopping and negotiate obscure stuff on transfer pricing and tax treaties for a model tax convention that would be translated into 20 years time uh, through bilateral negotiations. So that, that, that was quite a side. Uh, and, and this was about, I mean, the rules that we all know about, tax treaties, transfer pricing is based on the uh, model tax convention, the OECD model tax convention, drawing on the League of Nations model tax convention back to the 1920s. And it was not that sexy to say that we were working on a model which was first elaborated in 1928, right? And, and, and that was the life of international tax lawyers. And, and, and suddenly, suddenly, you have all these on the front page of the main newspapers. I mean, last week we did the front page of the Financial Times, on the Wall Street Journal, on the French Le Monde, and, and some other papers across the world. So international tax is, is getting sexy. Uh, how come? Um, 
And, and unfortunately, the answer is because of the financial crisis. I mean, the worst crisis ever, which has brought the politicians back to tax policy. And, and I know some are very unhappy. I read a number of articles, or I heard a number of people saying, how come? I mean, we now have finance ministers, I mean, caring about, about tax policy. I mean, they should leave that to tax specialists, not, not for politicians. And I think it's, it's deeply wrong. I mean, this is about politics. This is about policy. This is about ministers. And the financial crisis has been able to bring them back there for a very simple reason. We're back in 2008, and we have the Lehman Brothers collapse, and the governments across the world have to put hundreds of billions of dollars or euros just to save the banks. And at the same time, you have a number of scandals, the, the big one being the Liechtenstein scandal, the Elgete scandal, you may remember, a morning of St. Valentine's in Germany, the uh, CEO of Deutsche Post is woken up by the police and the TVs, which is not a nice way to be woken up, uh, and, uh, and he's arrested because he stashed a few billions or hundreds of millions, or I don't know, in, in Liechtenstein. And, and this started a big scandal, uh, which drew the political attention, which turned into pressure after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So that's, that's the story. Why did this scandal work? Because you have scandals every day, I mean, on a large scale basis. But this one did work. And I think it worked because February 08 comes after August 07, where you have the subprime crisis which starts, where you have some doubts being instilled in the mind of politicians about, about their relationship with the, with the financial industry, about the role of the financial industry. And they have their doubts and then they suddenly realize they will have to put a lot of public money, taxpayers' money, to save the banks and they say, well, we cannot do that in an environment where we have high net worth individuals defrauding us massively because of the use and the abuse of bank secrecy. We need to do something with that. And it started in Washington on the 15th of November 2008, where the G20, even before the OECD was trying to get in the G20 circle, uh, the G20 told us, please work on the end of bank secrecy. And that's what we actually managed uh, to do quite quickly with a list which was established for the following summit of the G20, which was held in London on the 2nd of April uh, 2009. And that was for good and bad reasons. The good reasons are those I've just indicated. The bad reasons, I think, were that the governments didn't really know how to handle the financial crisis. And when you have a scapegoat that everybody understands about, you use that scapegoat, the tax havens. And the French president at that time Nicolas Sarkozy was very good at that. I mean, I don't know how to handle the situation. Let's beat on them. I mean, at least they know why we, we, we beat them uh, if we don't really know why we are doing it. And, and that's exactly what, what happened. Um, and this translated into the end of bank secrecy, at least exchange of information on request, which then translated into automatic exchange of information thanks to the fantastic typically American unilateral extraterritorial legislation. <laughs> the US are fantastic about that, you know. What is, what is good for me may not be good for you, but please implement. And, <laughs> and it worked. And, and of course, then you had what they call themselves the G, so you have Gs everywhere. So you have a G5. I don't know if you know about the G5. I mean, the, the, the European countries, who, which think they're big, uh, UK, Germany, France, no, they are big, please, I'm French, uh, Italy and, uh, and Spain, saying, I mean, FATCA, first, they, they didn't believe in it. I mean, they said, not possible. And, and, and then they woke up, they say, well, they are going to kill our banks when we give all the information to the US. So we want to protect our banks. And, and to do that, we need to have agreements with the US. And by the way, as the US is not 100% sure on how to implement FATCA, maybe we could negotiate some form of agreement, like multilateral competent authority agreement, which will allow us to comply, I mean, give them the information so that our banks will be deemed compliant. That was the first step of the thinking. The second step of the thinking 
immediately was, and by the way, the Swiss are going to give all the information to the US and not to us. So we want to multilateralize FATCA. And they turned to the OECD because we had the expertise, we were there. We did the blacklist of the tax haven back in 2009 and we were available to provide the infrastructure, to provide the, uh, I mean, the, the skills to uh, put that in place. And that's, that's what we did and that's how we ended up in 2013 with a mandate of the G20 to do a common reporting standard, which we delivered in 2014. And with that, we've established a worldwide standard, largely drawing on FATCA. But you see that it's, it has been an interactive way from the G20 saying we need to put an end to bank secrecy through FATCA, which actually facilitated things, but with the international community deciding to cooperate. One thing which facilitated our work I'm not necessarily I mean, very proud of that, is that the dividing line was between the very big guys and the very small guys. You know, you had the high tax countries, which are big countries, and then you have tax havens, which are small jurisdictions. And when you have all the big guys ganging up with you to say, you guys, you need to do that, and you're very small, you say, yes, sir, and you move. And this is what has happened, and that's why there is some resentment from the small <laughs> jurisdictions. But at the same time, what we offered them was to level the playing field. And that's where we moved from an OECD G7 type of environment, where we started in the 90s the work on harmful tax practices, which had not been successful, because the small jurisdictions said, well, I mean, please, I mean, clean up your own house first talk to Switzerland, talk to Luxembourg, talk to some others before telling us what to do. And the OECD member countries then were a bit short of a response. Why? With the support of the G20 and all countries moving, we've been able to offer leveling the playing field. And that's what we established as soon as September 2009 with a global forum on transparency and exchange of information for tax purposes. We were able to bring all the countries and the jurisdictions on an equal footing for the implementation of the worldwide standard which had been agreed. I think that was the first time we did that. And that worked. And that worked because you had a good conjunction of factors. You had the G20, I mean, eyebrowing from the G20 is having an impact, believe it or not. Then you have leveling the playing field, and at some point you have the small jurisdictions calling me and say, well, you're doing the review of that other small offshore jurisdiction, please check these because their IBCs has tripled in, in six months' time, so very important that you check this out. And then you have all the G20 finance ministers pushing for this, and the countries on an equal footing, and it worked. So we've moved from a G7 OECD cozy environment, but not functioning that well, to a G20 OECD plus environment, which actually delivered. And what did, what did it deliver? It did deliver changes. Not reports, not talks, but actual changes. With cash coming in the coffers of the member countries. We are now uh, at more than 37 billion euros, which have been collected by the member and the non-member countries. I even saw last week that the Fijis, the Fijis, they have passed the legislation for a, a voluntary disclosure initiative, meaning that they benefit from this new transparent environment. And when you deliver, and when you deliver cash to governments which are short of cash, uh, they are appreciative. And, and that was the first act of, of this play which actually has been successful. So we said, well, let's move to the next step. The next step is, is about the tax haven issue. You know, the tax haven issue, as we described it back in, 19, in, the, in 1997, 98, with a report on harmful tax practices, was about, one, lack of transparency, lack of exchange of information, but second, and, and that was a bit of an awkward definition, no real activity. Zero tax and no real activity plus lack of transparency. It was a bit unclear. So we did tackle some harmful tax practices here and there, but, but we were left with something nobody was really able to define and even less to tackle. 
which was how can we have a world where the activities are taking place in the countries where you know the people are employed or the sales are taking place and the profits being in jurisdictions where actually you wouldn't expect them to be. I always quote the two trillion US dollars stashed in Bermuda. I mean, that's a fact, is it not? I don't know whether it's two trillion, one point something. It's a, it's a lot of money, you know. And it's very hard to explain why it is the case. It's very hard to explain why 27% of direct investment to India comes from Mauritius. I love the Mauritius. They are very, I mean, entrepreneurial. But still, I mean, 27% of direct investment, you see that there is a problem. I love the Dutch. I love the Netherlands. An official report from the Netherlands government indicated last year or two years ago that we had on average 10,000 tax lawyers living on treaty shopping. It, uh, I'm not saying 10,000 tax lawyers in the Netherlands. 10,000 tax lawyers in the Netherlands living on treaty shopping, which is a lot of people. Uh, I love Luxembourg, uh, and, and they've been so successful at, at issuing rulings, uh, so many rulings that one time, once uh, the, uh, the French director of French, uh, I mean the French tax director of a French company told me, well, I have a ruling which was issued with a condition that it shouldn't leave the safe. So it's in paper and it shouldn't leave the safe. So maybe there was something wrong about all that. Um, so as we had been successful and dealing with uh, exchange of information, we thought that maybe it was time to tackle the other aspect of the tax haven issue, recognizing that that was much more difficult because the dividing line was not about the big guys and the small guys. So it would require a much more sophisticated approach. And more fundamentally, I think there were some short-term trends justifying action and, and longer-term uh, trends. Uh, on the short term, of course, we all had in mind the stories by Jesse Drucker or some others saying that there were some international, large multinational companies paying actually very little on foreign income. And, and this had become a real front page story. So you had, um, I mean, some political dimension there. The man or the woman in the street had heard about some companies not paying much taxes at a time where corporate income tax for small and medium-sized companies, at a time where personal income tax for many individuals, at a time where value-added taxes. So I know it's an American audience, and I have to explain you VAT, it's, it's a consumption tax. <laughs> you, you may heard about it one day here in this country too. Uh, so uh, VAT has increased in 27 out of 33 OECD countries having that, okay? And, and it hits, it hits badly the people. And at that time, you see that the big juicy companies don't pay much, if any. And you have a political issue, especially at a time where the trust in governments is collapsing. I mean, you have populist parties emerging everywhere and taking over in some countries. Not talking about the US, of course, uh, but, but in many European countries, it's, it's, it's happening. So the lack of trust uh, by citizens, uh, the lack of trust by tax administration was, was also another factor. You know, when, when you're a tax administrator and you lose all the cases you bring to court, and I've been a great loser, maybe I still am, but uh, I've been a great loser as the head of the tax litigation of the French administration. We litigated transfer pricing stuff, we lost. We litigated commissionaire arrangement, we lost. And we lost because we were told, well, the way the transfer pricing guidelines are written are such as you cannot do this, you cannot dispute this. The way Article 5 uh, of the Model Tax Convention is translated in the bilateral treaties have been drafted is such that you cannot lose the commissionaire arrangement. So you have tax administration being not only frustrated, but doubtful on the relevance of the international tax standard. And then you have all these, um, all these politicians wandering, being under pressure by their people, 
And they say, well, I mean, why are we bound by these international tax rules? Who are these people at the OECD to tell us what to do? Why would we limit our sovereignty when there is no reason for that, especially as the rules don't work well? And therefore, why don't we take protectionist measures? And at a time where you have the financial crisis hitting and the need to take actions, it's very tempting to take protectionist measures, which would increase the risk, which would harm cross-border investment, but, but which would politically give some satisfaction to the people. You also had some longer-term longer trends that, that were underlying uh, the environment and which then justified action. The, the, the first one is, is so obvious. I mean, the rules actually dated back to the 1920s. They had been designed in another world, in a world where globalization was marginal. I mean, it, we had a few multinational companies, but they were not the, they were not the core of the uh, global system. And with this globalization, we definitely uh, had to rethink or revisit these rules. Another underlying factor is about this concept of, of tax sovereignty. But, but when you put tax sovereignty on the one hand and globalization on the other hand, you need to square the circle. Because all the countries are sovereign and that dates back to the, I mean, Middle Age. That's one of the legacy of the war between the French and the English uh, in the 14th and 15th century where the concept of sovereignty emerges. And it emerges at the same time as consent to tax. Consent to tax because the governments have to levy taxes to fund the war. And at the same time, you have the emergence of sovereignty, the emergence of consent, of, of, of consent to tax, and tax will be at the core of sovereignty. And that's been the case since then. The governments are sovereign. The countries are sovereign from a tax perspective. They do what they want, and they don't care about what happens across the border. Except that when you have local governments and global businesses, you may have gaps between these sovereignties. And you may keep your nominal sovereignty, but what about the actual sovereignty, where actually the profits or the high net worth individual's money will go to the interstices between the tax sovereignties? And the financial crisis, I think, has been a wake-up call for the governments to tell them, well, if you want to protect your actual sovereignty, you'd better limit the nominal sovereignty through tax cooperation. I would not use a four-letter word here in the US, which is regulation. I think it's an awful <laughs> word, right? Uh, but but in, in Europe, that's the word we, we would use. We would say, well, I mean, with, with national sovereignties and, and globalization on the other hand, you need some form of regulation, but we can call it cooperation. That's the same word, and it's not a four-letter word. And Bridging the gaps between sovereignties, I think, has something which has come to the mind of these people, especially as we told them, well, your choice is either you take protectionist measures, you move on your own, and you can do this, that's your right, or you try to cooperate so that we can save the rules to eliminate double taxation, because all this is about the elimination of double taxation. All this is about making sure that we have an environment where the investors can be secured because the states decided when they established corporate income tax and personal income tax to limit their right to tax so that there would be no double taxation. That was a policy decision that they took a long time ago and that they should stick to. And because of all these reasons, I think we had the recipe, if not for success, at least for further work to address base erosion and profit shifting. Anecdotally, I, I could tell you uh, that in 2012, uh, when I was appointed director for the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD, I had a new bureau. The bureau is made of 12 OECD member countries, representatives. And we gathered, so it was a new crowd, and I asked them, what are you concerned about? What, what would you like to work on in the next three years? And all of them, including the Swiss delegate, 
who was the tax commissioner at that time, said, we're concerned with base erosion and we're concerned with profit shifting. And, and they repeated that several times, base erosion, profit shifting, base erosion, profit shifting. So I wrote it down, BEPS, I turned to a native English native speaker, for little word, is it safe? Yes, it's safe, you can go ahead. <laughs> And we decided, we decided to launch the BEPS project. And then for many reasons, I will not give the details of, I managed to get that on the radar screen of the G20 in Los Cabos in June 2012. Because we thought we would have a few years, I mean, half a decade to work on that. And you will remember that in November 12, uh, we did have a number of G20 finance ministers getting very excited with BEPS because there was the Starbucks case, there was the Google case, there was the Amazon case in the UK and in some European countries say we need to address that urgently. Please do a report by our next meeting. Next meeting was in February 13. We did the report and say, well, actually there is a real issue. We cannot measure it. We don't have the data, but, but there is a real issue. A number of people told us, well, you cannot measure it because there is no issue. Look at corporate income tax, it's stable. So it's, it's, it's not declining. So there is no issue, you're making it up. Well, you may have seen through Action 11 that with the most conservative estimates, we have an annual cost for treasuries between $100 billion to $240 billion a year, globally. And I can tell you it's a very conservative estimate because our member countries didn't want to show too big figures, where actually the figures are higher. So we said we, we don't have the figures at that time, we didn't, uh, but, but there is a real issue. And we need to tackle it. And they told us, okay, good, please, we want a plan by our next meeting. And the following meeting was in July. So we did establish the BEPS action plan. And the BEPS action plan was about addressing this issue in a way which would be a holistic manner, consistently and comprehensively. Because we didn't want just to close down a few schemes known here and there, and we knew about a few schemes. I mean, for half, I mean, half a decade, we've had um, tax inspectors sharing information on the schemes they did find when doing audits. And at that time, I think we had 300 or 400 schemes known, most of them being just avoidance scheme. I mean, hybrid mismatches or, or other schemes which, which were familiar to the tax planner and then were becoming, becoming familiar to the uh, tax uh, auditors. So we knew the schemes, but we said, well, what we need to do actually is to draw from the failure or half success uh, of what we did in the 90s. And if we just close down some schemes or if we ask countries to close down harmful tax practices, we won't do much, especially as countries are sovereign and, and they will keep the tax competition among themselves because they're I mean, there is no agreement, no consensus globally on putting an end to tax competition. But what we need to put an end to is, is this thing that nobody can understand. The profits booked in one jurisdiction where nothing is happening. And then we may have some form of consensus because all the countries will agree. Then they can fight again on how to share that. <coughs> the Europeans and the Americans on the digital economy income or the Americans and the Indians and the Chinese on whatever, or the Europeans or the French and the Chinese on the luxury goods. They, they can fight, but for the time being, I mean, they fight for nothing because it's elsewhere. It's in tax havens. So at least they should all agree with that. But we also need to be mindful of not designing something that is implemented by everybody or its failure. Because, you know, I, 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 I tend to think that the legislative process in some countries across the Atlantic from Europe is, <laughs> is extremely difficult. So if we plan a big, you know, big beautiful machine where everything is going to work perfectly, if the U.S. changes all this legislation, well, you can just stop and, and go back home or go surfing or, or do another job. So we, we did engineer this in a way where we would not need all the countries to implement all the actions. First, because you don't want to rely on 
tax havens to implement. So you want to provide instruments for the country, to the countries willing to protect their tax bases so that they can do it without asking for permission from other countries. Or actually, you ask for permission because you want to do something which is cooperative, which is collaborative, which has been agreed by the others. <laughs> but you don't oblige the others to do. Why would you impose on Switzerland to pass a CFC legislation? They're not interested. They may not implement it properly. Why would you do that? Why would you ask Bermuda or the Bahamas or some others to install a corporate income tax? They don't want it. That's their sovereignty. But what you want to make sure is that if you're not happy with profits booked in a cash box in Bermuda or elsewhere, you have the instruments to neutralize that. And that's the way it's been engineered. Second, we are not completely naive. So we knew that, I mean, the tax planner industry is, is brilliant. I mean, they learn in the best universities, uh, including this one, right? Uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and we had to make sure that we would have the convergence of different instruments just to make sure that we would neutralize the schemes we wanted to neutralize. And that's how the 15 measures have been engineered through three pillars, you know about them. One is bridging the gaps between the sovereignty, and that may be the most innovative one. I know that there are some doubts on whether this will translate into anything. And I do think that this will translate into more cooperation. Countries can take the CFC legislation, enact the CFC legislations uh, they want whenever they want. They said that now they have agreed on best practices. They can limit interest deductibility the way they want. They don't need us. But they have agreed on the most, on the more efficient mechanism. And you may have seen that if they didn't say this is a minimum standard because we all need to implement now, and they didn't do so because a number of countries, starting with the US, are not able to implement. But they say we want to converge because many countries want to move and they know that, you know, they face the first mover dilemma. If I move on my own, uh, then I'm on my own, and nobody else moves, and I, I, I lose the money. Canada. So Canada say, well, okay, we'll move together. We want convergence, interest deductibility. And also we kept, I mean, the uh, harmful tax practices work together with something quite innovative, neutralizing hybrid mismatches. We've all talked about arbitrage for the past 20 years. Now we provide countries with a model uh, tax legislation or model treaty provision to put an end to this arbitrage. And I can tell you that countries will implement. They are implementing. The challenge we had was not to convince countries to implement, but to hel hold them on. Say, please wait. I mean, the UK don't do the DPT now. I mean, don't do the DPT at all. Uh, <laughs> Drawn on, on, on what's been agreed there. But countries are moving and they are converging into that dimension. That was the first pillar. And this is quite innovative. That's the OECD dealing with how do you bridge the gaps between these sovereignties? How do you make sure that one sovereignty will look at what the others are doing to decide on how to deal from a tax perspective with an element of income? The second pillar was about fixing the international instruments as they are, tax treaties. I mean, the commissioning arrangements, everybody wanted to put an end to that. The fragmentation of the permanent establishment, there was consensus that it needed to be fixed. The fact that in, in, in today's economy, the fact that you have delivery and, uh, and uh, storage in one country does not constitute a permanent establishment is a bit weird to explain to a common sense person. So, so we've, we've moved uh, there. But also uh, the treaty shopping. I mean, treaties have not been designed to be shopped. It's as simple as that. They are designed to eliminate double taxation, not to facilitate double non-taxation. So we've said, well, we need solid, I mean, provisions there. Of course, the US has the LOB, it works. Some other wants another method, it can work, it does work in the case of the UK, for instance. So we have a minimum standard there. And the countries in the course of the BEPS, I mean, work said, you know, it's not only a model that we want to do. We want to do more. We do want a minimum standard. We want to go further here. We want to go further on harmful tax practices, on the automatic exchange of tax rulings. 
on the Nexus approach for patent boxes. Let's be clear, we're not advocating patent boxes. And, and I know some of you are making fun of me to say the legacy of the BEPS project will be to have patent boxes all over the world, including in the US. Maybe not the best outcome, I must say. But what we've said is patent boxes are not great. They're pretty stupid from a tax policy perspective. But if you do them, at least make sure that they don't harm your neighbors with the Nexus approach. So minimum standard there on treaty shopping, on permanent establishment, fixing the rules. Transfer pricing. Here, if, if I measure the success of the BEPS project to the criticisms we face, I think we've been extremely successful because we're attacked from the left to the right. I mean, everybody's unhappy, so maybe we did something right. Huh? Uh, I mean, the NGOs uh, say that without unitary taxation, all this is a joke. And then if it is a joke, I would respond, fine, let's laugh together, together and let's stop worrying about corporate income tax. Because unit taxation is not going to happen anytime soon, even in the European Union. Can we fix the system as is? And I tend to think that, yes, we can. And I was struck by the fact that our transfer pricing rules which seems so sophisticated. You know, when you look at the transfer pricing guidelines, you find some real stuff for techies. They are very primitive. I mean, they, they didn't contemplate most of the cases where you just have a discrepancy between the real activity and the contracts. And that's where you have a number of tax lawyers saying, well, I mean, just look at the contracts full stop. And, and I respond to them, you're the best advocates of unitary taxation. I remember a meeting I had in January 14 in Palo Alto where I had the tax director of a large company explaining to me that we must keep the arm's length principle because it is the arm's length principle. <laughs> uh-huh. And that it, it was like this and we couldn't change it, otherwise the world would collapse. I say, well, you're the best advocate of unit free taxation. We, we have a principle which is pretty weak but can work if you reconcile the reality with, with the contracts or the contracts with the reality, which should be the job of, of the tax planners or the tax directors. So we say we need to delineate the real transaction. We need to look at who's able to manage the risks. And, and we've tried to anticipate the fact that sending 20 people to Bermuda just to manage all the risks of, of the company would not work. I mean, it's not as simple as that. So we've been attacked by the NGOs, we've been attacked by the business community telling us that the world would collapse. Uh, and I just do hope that uh, we have slightly more sophisticated rules which are a bit less primitive and which will just, I mean, make sense. Because what we had so far was nonsense. The fact that you can have a cash box with all the intangible of a company where the R&D is done in Palo Alto where you have, I mean, all, all the value added done by the real people somewhere else than in the tax haven, that just doesn't pass the uh, test for the minister or, or for the 12-year-old. Doesn't make sense. So we've, we've tried to address that. Finally, the third pillar was about transparency. I know that transparency is this type of word that all the people will use and, and nobody can be against transparency right? Uh, even though I, I have my doubt. I don't know what transparency is after all. The other day I was at a meeting in the European Union and one guy was saying transparency is transparent to the public. Otherwise it's not transparency. And I wondered all the work we've done on exchange of information, the end of bank secrecy therefore is not related to transparency because it's not public, but it, it cannot be public. So transparency from my perspective is transparency from the taxpayers to the tax administration. And maybe the other way around as well. And, and you know that there is an action related to more transparency from tax administrations to the taxpayers, and that's the action 14 on mutual agreement procedures. So we, we wanted to increase transparency there to provide more instruments to the tax administrations, the uh, mandatory disclosure regimes, the action 11 about measuring the phenomenon, having some indicators to follow this up. And very importantly, and you know about that, the country by country reporting. And, and this is an important piece of information that the tax administrations will collect. And I wish good luck to the tax directors when they will have to explain to their CEOs that all the turnover is in Europe, all the employees are in China, in the US, and all the profit is 
in a place where there is no employee, no asset, no turnover of any kind. Good luck. So maybe that should be an incentive to rethink the tax architecture of the company. You know that we've worked hard to make sure that this would happen. And the countries were all in agreement that this should go to tax administrations. Then there was a debate on local filing versus, I mean, headquarter filing. And we ended up with a quite complex mechanism. This mechanism will work as long as all the countries implement. It's a minimum standard, meaning that all the countries must implement. And we were relieved and satisfied to note that the US Treasury and US IRS views are that uh, this doesn't require legislation but can be done through regulation. And this was confirmed by Jack Lou last week in, in Lima. And I think that's, that's very important, especially if people want to resist public country by country reporting. Because if it doesn't work, at some point you will have pressure. In Europe, the European Parliament is very keen on pushing for public country by country reporting. So just have that in mind in, in case you, you have some lobbying activities uh, on the hill. So fixing the existing rules, bridging the gaps between sovereignties, increasing transparency, uh, are, are the uh, different pillars that have been developed and I can tell you that bringing all the G20 and the OECD countries plus developing countries on an equal footing to discuss all this in two years time, which was crazy. And I know we've been accused of just being crazy and nuts to go that fast. Uh, has not been a, a, a picnic party, you know, an easy uh, picnic party, not at all. Uh, it's been very difficult. But two comments there. One is we have reached meaningful, a meaningful real agreement on these measures by all the involved countries. I've read in the press that this is not meaningful. They don't even know what they agree upon. I can tell you that they know what they agree upon. And I can tell you that there has been negotiation between some which had conservative views on transfer pricing, for instance, and some others which were willing to tax much more at source, where the issue was not source residence, but, but again, putting an end to double non-taxation. Real negotiation between economies which have very different perspective. And it has worked. And what's striking is that today, I can tell you that all the G20 non-OECD countries. For those of you who are not that familiar, we have Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Russia, India, China, Indonesia. These are the eight G20 non-OECD countries. They want to remain at the Committee on Fiscal Affairs on an equal footing. It's a no-brainer. We hear, we stay, we get closer. Of course, they have different views. Brazil in particular, which is an island in the international tax world. But they want to converge. Three years ago, one dream that I think collectively we would have had was to say, well, we need our standards to be as relevant as possible, meaning as broadly accepted as possible. We're there. Now, the challenge is to get developing countries fully on board. But having the G20 is, is a no-brainer. It has happened. It's here. And we'll keep it. So I think that's, that's a significant uh, legacy uh, from, from that uh, work. Act three, and I will stop here. Act three is about implementation and it is to be written. Because we have agreed a significant change of the rules. I think it's already having an impact. Nash, I'm just, I mean, doing wishful thinking, which I'm good at. Uh, but we, we do have now a writing on the wall. I mean, if, if, if you just wait for all the legislations to change, maybe you're not that smart. Legislations are changing. Country by country reporting is happening. Transfer pricing rules have changed. It has happened. That's real. Tax treaties will change soon, not in two, in two decades' time. We have a multilateral instrument negotiation which has started. We're going to have the second meeting of negotiation in two or three weeks' time. 
in Paris. We have 91 or 92 exchanges every day countries which are participating on an equal footing to the negotiation of the multilateral instrument. I understand the US is now part of it. This is significant. Well, will the US ratify um, someday a multilateral instrument? Maybe not. But we don't need the US because the minimum standard on, on treaty shopping, the US meets the standard. Now, if the US wants to have arbitration with 30 plus countries at once, be welcome. If you don't want that, don't sign or don't ratify. But it is happening. And this will ensure, I mean, better implementation and faster implementation for all countries. And, I mean, increased certainty for the taxpayers. Because when you have treaties which are being updated, you have 3,600 bilateral treaties. I never counted them, so I rely on the figures from the IBFD here. But when you have that amount of, of treaties, to change them, it really takes many years. And then you can do other forms of arbitrage or so between the treaties. They will all change at once. And we will complete the negotiation by the end of 2016 with many, many countries on board. So things are happening. So you'd better anticipate all that. And countries are changing their legislation. But we also need now to engineer the implementation phase. How will we assist countries changing their legislation? That's something we're facing on exchange of information. The countries are coming to us and say, well, how, how should I amend my legislation here? Oh, please put in place a common transmission system. So we're getting in this business of organizing the real cooperation on the ground between countries. We also need to monitor, to monitor the implementation of the minimum standards. All the countries have agreed, and they are very concerned about leveling the playing field on treaty shopping, on harmful tax practices, or on whatsoever. But we also need probably to move away from the uh, sexy front pages of papers to go back to, I mean, the real challenge, which is proper implementation by tax administrations. The rule of law, making sure that tax administrations do not turn rogue because they now have the right instruments to adjust the taxpayers. So that we have a cooperative approach with taxpayers and between tax administrations. That's a big challenge ahead of us. We've never worked at the OECD on how are transfer pricing rules implemented in practice in our own member countries. Maybe we should do that to identify the discrepancies and see how we can improve stuff marginally. So these are big, big things uh, ahead of us with another challenge, which is that we need to be inclusive. We've been willing to be inclusive. And at the beginning, we wondered whether we should start with 100 countries in this project. But if you start with 100 countries, you never land or you crash because that's too many people around the table. That's why we had to start gradually. And that's why we had initially all the G20 countries on an equal footing and the following year, 18 developing countries joining. And now we are mandated by the G20 to establish a, an inclusive framework for implementation which will be some form of global forum on BEPS or something like that. That may sound like a nightmare for some of you, but that's the future. And now, if we look ahead five years from now, um, what will my successor for the 25th uh, lecture uh, say? Maybe he or she will say, well, all that was very funny, but actually without former apportionment doesn't mean anything. And maybe by then we'll move towards more profit split, which is on the program for 2016. Maybe some, Michael Dover would say, well, the only solution is destination principle. I mean, source residence, that's over. Without destination, and I don't know what it is at the end of the day, global VAT or something like that, we will, will not fix the problem. Maybe it's true, maybe not. Or the digitalization of the economy, the uberization of the economy as we say in Europe. I don't know whether you say it here, but, but that's, that's terrifying in, in Europe, uberization of the economy. I mean, you, you lose all the control on, on, on anything. Uh, what, what will be the challenges? The, the report on action one, I think, is, is pretty much interesting. First, because it provides some quick fixes to VAT and to corporate income tax through the definition of Article 5. But it also says, unlike what we did in Ottawa, 
back in 2000, where we said nothing new. Nil no we subsole, we don't need to change. Here we say, hmm, we'd better monitor. We don't know what's gonna happen. So we keep going on. We have a few options. These options are not consensual. Well, I can tell you that India says, hmm, they are consensual, and the US says, no, they are not consensual. <laughs> but there are a few options. And there is agreement on the need to monitor, on the need to check this out on a regular basis. And, 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 and so shall we be doing. And finally, I mentioned inclusiveness a number of times, but, but we'll, we'll have to address the challenge of developing countries. And that goes much beyond BEPS. Tax incentives for developing countries, the indirect transfer of assets, when the mining industry sells some mine, where are the capital gains taxable? Basic capacity building, or the balance between source and residence taxation. These are key challenges for these countries, and there is full consensus among foreign affairs people. I mean, the finance people are very nervous there, but foreign affairs people in all the countries say, we need to put the emphasis on domestic resource mobilization. And I think we need to be consistent there. So we probably need to revisit that with the IMF, with the World Bank, with the UN. But that will be part of the landscape. Now, I don't know. I mean, I don't know in what people will say in five years' time. I tend to think that actually the landscape will not be that different. That things change gradually and that in five years' time we will still benefit, so to speak, from this BEPS project in the sense that we'll have a broader community agreeing on a common set of rules, we'll have more cooperation, more exchange of information, tax administrations will speak to each other, will better speak to their taxpayers, and I do hope that taxpayers, tax planners, will go back to business as usual or as usual as it was 20 years ago, which is to plan, to optimize, to reduce the tax burden marginally, but not to be a profit center. But we'll see that in five years' time. Thank you very much. Well, that is a tremendous amount of food for thought, I think, for all of us, uh, including those of us who followed BEPS pretty closely. We have some time. We've allocated some time for questions, and uh, there are microphones in the center. So if anyone would like to ask Pascal anything at this point, now is the time to do so. Everybody's bashful tonight? Nobody has any questions? There we go. Roy Berg. Roy Berg will get up. I'll be the one to, uh, to break the ice. Um, uh, so Pascal, uh, the, the recent changes to action uh, item number five uh, you know, on uh, uh, harmful practices, uh, you know, requires a disclosure of domestic rulings uh, that result in lower taxation on international transactions under certain circumstances. Um, US law has severe uh, restrictions on the exchange or the disclosure of taxpayer information under 6103. To what extent does the success of action number, uh, action number, action item number five rely on the exchange of that specific taxpayer information? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Something is better than nothing. Action five, so there are two pillars, right? One is uh, the transparency of tax rulings, the other is the nexus approach. On transparency of tax rulings, we've identified six categories of rulings which must be exchanged. Some may consider that we go slightly beyond what was initially agreed in 1998 uh, on the criteria of what is harmful, but there is agreement. The US is fully backing this action. I'm not aware of any problem that the US would have to exchange the information included in the six categories which have been identified in the measure. And you may have noticed that the European Union has already implemented this and is fully compliant 
with the neck I mean with the uh, automatic with the spontaneous compulsory exchange of tax rulings because uh, they call it automatic we call it spontaneous compulsory but that's equivalent and uh, we we have the same rules by the way of retrospectivity which is five years mm -hmm. for the rulings which are into force in 2014 so the category you refer to I'm not aware of any difficulty that the US would have in making sure that this information will end up in the right hands, meaning the hands of the competent authorities of the countries which could be impacted by such rulings. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Yes, Itai. Itai? Uh, you better, you better go over. Yeah. <coughs> so, Pascal, uh, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. and. Uh, you know, congratulations for achieving something that many in this room would have said was impossible three years ago. Uh, one of the key messages of your talk is that politicization of international tax made things possible that were never possible before. And then uh, the question that that raises to my mind, which I wonder what you think about, is are there things that politicization makes more challenging? And are you prepared to say kind of what you think those are, because that's the question. That's a good question, uh, meaning that I don't have the answer. <laughs> uh, politicization, yes, for sure. And again, I think tax policy belongs to politicians and must do so. Now, there are always risks going with that. And the risk is, I mean, just getting populist trying to get easy fixes for complex issues. We, we should never hide, especially as civil servants, as technocrats, we should never hide behind complexity. Say, you don't understand, it's too complex. At the end of the day, you have a real test. Does it make sense or not? Does it pass the test or not? And I think it's true everywhere. So when you don't understand something, or when you're not able to explain something to a decision maker, there is something wrong. Either the decision maker is really dumb, but, but you cannot assume that, or, or you have a problem. And, and you know, if you, if you apply that to the financial industry, I think we would have saved a lot of money and crisis uh, um, if, if we had that, that test. So politicization clearly has helped in terms of getting the top-down approach. You know, when you have civil servants, the multilateral instrument is a good example. When I was a treaty negotiator, uh, and the chair of Working Party 1 uh, of the OECD, which is the Working Party where treaty negotiators discuss, we said, well, if we all agree on the provision to update the Model Tax Convention, then we should have a mechanism to implement that, I mean, quickly uh, through a process. But, I mean, you're just a head of unit in a large, I mean, body, and you need to reach your minister, I mean, to go through many steps, and, and you never convince the ministers of that. When you have all the G20 finance ministers meeting and you tell them, because they are, I mean, common sense guys, you know, if you all agree on the substance, why don't you translate that into a tax treaty, a multilateral treaty, which will amend the bilateral treaties? And they say, well, yeah, why not? So you can do that. Now, what are the down, I mean, the, the downsides uh, of this? Or, or does this make things more complicated? At some point, um, you, you, you may have, where you have the real fights, um, some blockage, but, but so far we haven't dealt with the issues with the real fights. Because the real fights are with the small jurisdictions, which are not in the G20. Uh, and, and which are not that legitimate to say, I mean, you know, the, the small jurisdictions in, an, in, another word, in another word, they have benefited almost unduly from globalization. And I don't put the blame on them. Now I have plenty of friends in all these jurisdictions since I created the Global Forum. So they have benefited, but, but was it the right thing? Probably not. So now it's back, back to normal. So the politicization at the, at the G20 level so far has not created any major difficulties, but has been a problem solver. I remember a meeting even a more exclusive meeting than the G20 meeting. It's a G7 meeting. 
it's much more exclusive because the G20, you have a big hall with, I mean, it's very official. The G20, it's in the dining room of a hotel uh, in Dresden, and around the table, you have 10 people, just the 10 finance ministers. And I remember a discussion, quite lively discussion, between Jack Lou and George Osborne. It was on BEPS, and I, I let you guess what, what they were talking about there. Uh, and, and, and that has been more of, a, of, of a, a facilitation in terms of identifying the issues and then going, I mean, going to solution or at least common understanding uh, or better understanding uh, of, of the issues. So, so far, no, I don't see major difficulties arising from that. Uh, we'll see on the way forward for the implementation. What I can tell you is that uh, both in Lima and before in, in Beijing, I met him a couple of times. Lu Jiwei, the, G, I mean the, the finance minister of China, uh, who's going to take over the G20 presidency on the 1st of December, uh, he said, and be happy or scared, your choice, uh, but he said among the key priorities of the G20 Chinese presidency, among the top priorities, the top four priorities is BEPS. BEPS implementation, so BEPS is not going to go away from the uh, G20 agenda, but that would be for the implementation of the inclusive framework and to make sure that this, this translates into finance. Thanks a lot, Pascal, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture and uh, amazing project. Uh, and I have two questions in the, on the political aspect and the professional aspect of the, of the BIPS project. Uh, at the political aspect, it is clear that the role of the OECD is rising and the OECD is playing uh, an amazing project, an amazing role, but is there really more international cooperation in the international tax system today and, uh, and in the future? Uh, I am not sure. Uh, there is really more uh, cooperation in the easy issue of, uh, of uh, automatic exchange of information but when we come to the difficult issues of international co of uh, tax, international tax competition, on e-commerce taxation, and all the other issues, there is no real uh, agreement between the between the countries and real cooperation. And I will give you the last uh, example: uh, the EU itself, about six months ago, initiated its own mini semi. A BEPS project. I don't know what uh, what to call it, and and they try to describe it in uh, in different ways. And uh, how to what are the relations between the EU project and the OECD project? So, given the the EU project and the other uh, issues, I am I am wondering: is really a, we really face more international cooperation in the 21st uh, century? Uh, I, am not, uh, I am not sure about, uh, about that. And as to the professional uh, uh, aspect, uh, automatic exchange of information is really, uh, is really important, uh, and it gives the uh, international tax authorities more tools. Uh, but the lack of information uh, wasn't the real, uh, the real problem of the international tax uh, system. Tax authorities knew what Google is, uh, is doing. They knew what Starbucks uh, is, is, is doing, but they didn't have the, the tools to face, uh, to face these, uh, these problems. Uh, so do we really give them uh, the, tools, uh, the tools today? Uh, and what do you think about the role of the, of the public? Let's, what about the idea of making the, the disclosure rules not disclosure to the, to the tax authorities, but disclosure to the public so that, uh, that the public, the market, the newspaper, the media, the NGOs uh, might be more successful in tackling these uh, tax planning schemes more than the uh, tax authorities with all the conflicts between the countries. Thanks. Well, th thanks for this. On, on, on the first one, I, uh, I, I would respectfully disagree. I think we do have more cooperation. I mean, exchange of information is not anecdotal. And, and beyond that, you create communities. I mean, you create the community of the competent authorities. They talk to each other. They build programs together. They pick up the phone and talk to the other because they know the other. Uh, it reminds me of a time where I was the French competent authority. You just didn't know the people because you never met them. 
and, and, and to solve mutual agreement procedure, it was just a nightmare. You sent, I remember, sending letters to inform the other competent authority that we had a case. And then three months later, I received the, the response saying, well, he's no more the competent authority. Please resend the letter. So <laughs> resend the letter. And, and it was endless. We are building a community. I, I think it's not totally by accident that the US and India which seem to have some issues on mutual agreement procedures, <laughs> that they've been able to come to term that quickly. I mean, Bob Stack and Akilesh Ranjan, and they are both fantastic. They meet every six weeks in Paris. I mean, it's, it's about cooperation. It's about talking to each other. It's about building something together. It's about reporting the same things to your ministers and briefing them and, and building this. And that goes beyond exchange of information. The, the second thing is, I've read in a number of, of law firms survey that uh, a number of countries have taken more than 50 unilateral measures before the completion of the BEPS project. And then, I, I mean, I was alerted. I, I went looking at the details. Most of these measures are CFC hybrids and so it's true that they were taken but but it's been the case for the past 50 years that countries take unilateral measures the difference here is that they don't do it without talking to the others I'm not saying that the world is perfect I'm not saying that they are all BEPS compliant but we we do have something like more convergence like more cooperation. I strongly believe in that. And I would take the EU example precisely to illustrate that. The EU package that they tabled is fully BEPS compliant except for the um, um, uh, CCCCCTB or something like that, you know, the consolidated uh, uh, common base uh, uh, for corporate income tax. Except for that, they are fully compliant. Exchange of tax rulings is a good illustration. They ended up exactly in the same place as we did. On the common reporting standard, we've been able to establish a CRS with a mechanism, an IT mechanism to exchange information, which is EU and FATCA compatible. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident there. As regards the tools, would public pressure be more efficient? What I am paid for is to make sure that the tax administrations get the information. And I can tell you that around the table, the 60 plus countries which were there, none of them said we should go public. They all said we need the information for ourselves and we know that we have to rely on the headquarter company country to get a cross check on the information we'll get. So jeopardizing the whole mechanism to get it public, and I see why, I mean, the academics, the NGOs, and some others would like the information to be public, and I have respect for that. But jeopardizing tax administrations getting the information for, I mean, just the public, that was not the goal, and, and I'm confident that we'll get something which will be up and running very soon. It starts on 2016 fiscal year accounts, and the in information exchange will start in 17, 18, so that's for tomorrow. Last question, you have it. Thank you. Uh, Pascal, as you may be aware, a Tax Foundation, which is a conservative think tank in this country, is honoring Bob Stack next month for protecting U.S. interests in these negotiations with BEPS. Uh, I wonder if from your perspective, uh, to what extent was the U.S. stance on various action plans an impediment to progress? To what extent did it help? And how do you think it'll play out in the implementation phase, knowing as you do Mr. Jacob Liu's position, Mr. Stack's position, who will continue to represent the U.S. interests? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think Bob did his job, which is to protect U.S. interests. Akilesh Ranjan did his job, which was to protect Indian interests. Edouard Marcus did his job, which was to protect the French interests. All the countries around the table protected their interests. What was a bit tricky was that they had to reach agreement by consensus. And you know the rule of consensus. You reach consensus when nobody puts the flag up to stop. It's not unanimity. In the EU, it's in the European Union, it's unanimity meaning that everybody has to say yes. And when you're called on to say either yes or no, very easily you will say no. 
consensus, it's more difficult to say, well, I'm going to block this, especially as this is soft legislation. So they had to agree by consensus, which means that Bob did a great job, but I think Akhilesh Ranjan to take, I mean, two countries at the end of, I mean, extreme ends of the spectrum there in terms of interest on transfer pricing, for instance. They both did a great job because they agreed. So they did protect the, their national interests, but they were also, they had also to compromise and they did compromise. So then you can tell the story you want, a one-sided story to say, actually, there is no change at all and we are all comfortable. So be it, I'm very happy with that. But the truth is that this is a real compromise. Why? Because it's a meaningful set of agreements which, which has been reached. And all that is reflected in the explanatory statement that I should have mentioned, which is on the top of all the reports, to make sure that people knew what they were agreeing upon. Minimum standards, convergent measures. These are not legal terms, these are political terms, which reflect the commitment. So again, Bob did a tremendous job, he was a real pain in the neck at some point of the negotiation, <laughs> as were a number of other delegates. But at the end of the day, we got agreement on something that all the countries think is a good set of instruments to fight base erosion and profit shifting. And I'm not sure that there is any frustrated countries there. They are all happy. And that's why we ended up uh, on Friday morning in uh, Lima with so many ministers, even the finance minister of Peru, who's not a member of the G20, said, I want to be there as the host country because I participated to the work and I want to be there. So everybody is, is equally unhappy or happy and, and that's the beauty of good compromises. A any way you look at it, we have reached a major inflection point in the field of international taxation, and we are extremely fortunate to have Pascal here uh, to give us fresh news and to report on this fantastic achievement, which is not only an achievement of the OECD, but I think an achievement for you personally, Pascal. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.